Good afternoon and welcome to the Gender Equity Summit brought to you by the National Postdoctoral Association or the MPA. I'm Tom Kimbis, I'm Executive Director and CEO of the MPA, which is the national voice of the Postdoctoral Association, excuse me, community. Today, more than 70,000 postdocs across the country provide innovation and creativity and leadership to our most difficult issues that uh, face us across all disciplines. And if you weren't with, with us yesterday, uh, the new NPA strategic plan highlights many different factors, but in, including DEI, diversity, mm -hmm. equity, inclusion, was one of its four core pillars of its work. When we launched this summit in light of this new plan to advance the conversation around inequities that are happening uh, in the postdoc community around gender issues, and also to drive beyond conversation, positive actions to improve the postdoctoral environment. So this summit is intended to cover all gender identities, even if one speaker is focusing on issues uh, that affect a particular identity, the lessons are intended to be uh, drawn out broadly and apply broadly. Same thing if they're speaking from one discipline, say in the life sciences, uh, all are intended to benefit uh, our broad audience. We wanted to thank our summit partners, the Association of American Medical Colleges, or AMC, the Association for Women in Science, the Higher Education Recruiting Consortium, as well as Out to Innovate, formerly known as Noggle Step. The summit consists of five sessions, three of which happened yesterday. I hope you were able to join us uh, for some of those uh, and two today, including the one you're in right now. If you missed any of the ones yesterday, um, they will be available. They're, all these sessions are being recorded and will be on the NPA's website at nationalpostdoc.org um, shortly after the conclusion of the summit. This is intended to be a conversation. Our, our uh, moderator, uh, Vipul Sharma, I'm sure will get us started on that, but please engage with us today. We want to keep the conversation going and these issues being discussed. Uh, um, if you aren't a member already of the MPA, uh, your membership as an individual is most likely free. Um, all postdocs, students, faculty, and staff of any organization that has an organizational membership with us, with the MPA, is, is um, can sign up for free on our website. And if you do so, you're then keyed into getting all of the best news and uh, networking information, events, uh, opportunities, uh, all sorts of um, interesting uh, access to good resources that you might need. So uh, again, please visit us at nationalpostdoc.org and sign up. Um, it's also leadership opportunities available in July. This is the time of year that we flip over our board of directors. So there's some openings um, available now if you're interested in joining in that sort of capacity or in one of our many committees to help advance the postdoctoral community. Um, you also can follow us in our major media, social media outlets, um, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and LinkedIn uh, to keep up with what's happening at the NPA. So enjoy the panel, enjoy the summit, um, and I'll turn it over to Dr. Vipul Sharma, who is Assistant Director of Postdoctoral Affairs at the University of Chicago, also one of our international officers here at the National Postdoctoral Association. Bipul? Uh, thank you, Tom, and hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us on day two of NPA Gender Equity Summit. Uh, this session's topic is impacts and revelations of COVID on postdoc gender equity, and we have three speakers lined up. Uh, first is Maria Lund Dahlberg, who is a senior program officer at National Academy of Sciences, Engineering and Medicine. Uh, Aisha Tullock, who is an Australian Research Council Discovery Earlier Career Research Fellow at the University of Sydney. And Arpa Ghosh, who is a postdoctoral scholar at Iowa State University. Before we start, a quick preview of the platform. Uh, we have a chat option and a Q&A window, which everyone can use during the session. Uh, we will have a Q&A in the end. Bios and contact information of today's speakers are in the handout section, so everyone can download that. Um, also, we will have a few polls and audience engagement activities on uh, Mentimeter. Uh, I will put the link in the chat uh, during that, uh, whenever we start the poll and the, the activity. And as Tom me mentioned, the session is being recorded, so it is available for later. Um, on that note, our first speaker is Maria, who is uh, whose current work focuses on the response and adaptation of higher education on COVID-19 pandemic, uh, the science of effective mentoring in STEM, 
equity, diversity, and inclusion in post-secondary education, and on the impact of COVID-19 on research careers of women in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine, which was recently published. For today's session, she will focus on the findings of that report. Um, so Maria, over to you. Thank you so much, Prabhu. Uh, hello, yes, thank you for inviting me to join this panel today. My name is Maria Lindahlberg. I use she, her pronouns, and I serve as a study director with the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine. I was asked today to discuss some of the key elements and findings from our recent consensus study, the impact of COVID-19 on the careers of women in academic sciences, engineering, and medicine. And as you might already get in the impression, most of our work focuses on the STEM disciplines. Uh, next slide, please. As we begin, uh, we begin all of our presentations about this report by acknowledging that while the focus of our statement of task and indeed the focus of our report more broadly is on COVID-19, on women in academic STEM, the pandemic was not the only devastating event of 2020, nor did it impact all women equally. During stressful times, those individuals who are systematically disadvantaged are more likely to experience additional strain and instability than those who have an established reputation, a stable salary commitment, or found themselves in position of, of power. Women of color in particular tend to be affected more significantly than others, given the layers of gender bias and racism that can influence career trajectories. This past year was both extremely stressful, but it was also infused with hope, given the expanded conversations nationally that related to structural racism. Next slide, please. Our report on uh, women in, in COVID in STEM builds on research that was well established from before the pandemic, but has taken on new meaning in light of 2020. As was shown in the National Academy's Promising Practices report released last year, women contribute to and benefit STEM, but they are often underrepresented across many disciplines and fields. While there has been progress in recent years, many of the long-standing and systemic barriers remain, particularly for women of color. Next slide, please. And even before the COVID-19 pandemic, there were discrepancies by gender in salary, caregiving status, and stress levels. Caregiving in particular, both at home as well as at work, commonly falls toward to women. And women of color take on additional and often unrecognized labor in form of mentoring as well as service expectations. These differences hold when examined across careers, across institutions, as well as across disciplines. Next slide, please. Therefore, throughout the report and building on the approaches taken in the Promising Practices report, the committee took an intentionally intersectional lens, which they define here. This was particularly important because of the differences in how women of COVID, women of color, excuse me, uh, were or may be affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. Next slide, please. So I had the absolute honor of learning from and with a small and dedicated and highly insightful team as we worked to, quote, identify and analyze disruptions experienced by women in STEM academic careers during the early stages of the COVID-19 pandemic. I'd like to thank the contributions of all the individuals on this screen, as well as our, the support from our five sponsors, the National Institutes of Health, the National Science Foundation, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, the Alfred P. Sloan Foundation, and the Doris Duke Charitable Foundation. Next slide, please. In our report, we explore the impact of the pandemic on women in academic STEM within five central topical chapters of the report, shown here in our five very colorful boxes. We also present the findings of a survey of women in STEM faculty conducted for our report by Drs. Kosek, Allen, and Dumas, which they conducted in October of 2020 on the effects of COVID-19. Our statement of task did not ask and we do not make recommendations. 
which is unusual for a National Academies report. Rather, we provided a snapshot of our understanding at the end of 2020, along with research questions to try and inform future work, given the existence of only the preliminary evidence on hand. Next slide, please. It is not an understatement to say that COVID-19 changed nearly everything last year, which definitely includes academic STEM. We delayed our experiments in individual laboratories. Global conferences were canceled. We shifted our teaching and networking structures. Publication rates were altered and we blurred our boundaries between work and non-work. While adaptations were made, the disruptions that were caused by the pandemic have endangered the engagement, the experience, and the retention of women in academic STEM. Next slide, please. Women and other rep underrepresented groups studying and working in STEM fields are disadvantaged to a greater degree than their counterparts who are white and men. Women in academic STEM fields are more likely to be early in their career, to have a lower salary regardless of professional ranking in STEM, to be a single parent or primary caregiver, to, and to report experiencing greater work-related stress and discrimination in the workplace or in their community. Because women are underrepresented across most STEM fields, women are more likely to experience academic isolation, including limited access to mentors, sponsors, or role models that share various aspects of their identities. When coupled with the physical isolation that we all experienced during the past year, this had an even greater impact on their well being. Next slide, please. Women with caregiving responsibilities, such as elder care or child care, had less time to maintain or engage in collaborations or even conduct their work. For example, in the October survey conducted by Cassette, Cossack Allen and Dumas, over 70% of the responding women with childcare responsibilities reported challenges with access to childcare, and over half reported that the ch their children had heightened behavioral or academic needs. A quarter of the women who responded, the most popular of the responses given, said that their coping strategy simply involved becoming the primary caregiver. Other research showed that women reduce their work hours to accommodate the increase in caregiving responsibilities. Next slide, please. The October survey also included questions about work effectiveness. To note, this is a non-representative survey. And so rather than focusing on the per specific percentages shown on this slide, it's important uh, try and think about these as examples of various impacts. I'd like to see if we could launch a poll now um, and uh, see how you guys respond to this as well. Which of the following did you experience as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic? Increased workload, decreased productivity, changes in your interactions, or difficulties from remote work? You can choose more than one. Looks like we've come to a little bit of a hold on that. All right, so next slide, please. COVID-19 blurred our boundaries between the various roles that we take on, like scholar and mom. And while the remote work that we implemented can help facilitate management of work and non-work roles, it also has the ability to increase multitasking, interruptions, and work availability that may in turn harm your men mental health and well being. Next slide, please. So during 2020, many women adapted boundary management tactics to help, which includes ones that got reported in the October survey shown here. These included spatial boundaries like having just different workspaces or temporal boundaries like creating really strict schedules or even technological boundaries like using more 
than one device, your phone versus your computer. So I'd like to launch another poll and see if any of you implemented similar techniques. Again, you can choose more than one. Looks like they're coming in pretty even. <laughs> And I'd like to note that we, while a lot of these are useful, it's important to, to note, and the report notes this as well, that these individual tactics are not fail-safes. Relying on them to support the well-being of women in academic STEM or in any discipline may be insufficient. All right, next slide, please. So before I go on to my next couple of slides, I'd like to ask to show a quick video that highlights some of the responses that we heard to the survey um, and summarizes a bit more about our report. Stressed that the lack of that productivity will cause me to not get tenure. There is no guarantee whether I can have a postdoc in the next six months. Many challenges to women's success in sciences, engineering, and medicine predated the pandemic, but the COVID-19 pandemic and its associated disruptions have led to a number of changes that have had disproportionate impact on women. Our institution is facing mandatory 10% budget reductions. I'm in a vulnerable position as a non-tenured academic lecturer despite 25 plus years experience at this institution. COVID-19 has prevented me from working face-to-face -face with students and colleagues, traveling for work and working in the lab, all of which are critical to my work. What has been valued more is agentic productivity, getting grants, publishing papers, um, and those, um, those norms have led to a devaluing of the work that women disproportionately perform in the workplace as well. So there's both the intraprofessional and the extraprofessional caregiving that goes on uh, that needs to be valued and supported. Adnan seemed to think you could totally redesign your course on a dime in the middle of the semester and sent us ads from third-party vendors. This resulted also in very unhappy students. The stress was unbearable. And by June, I was in the ICU with a stroke. Thankfully, I've recovered sufficiently to keep working. We did get indications that women felt that they had excessive pressure beyond just the gender bias that we see in academia. I have to hole up in my bedroom for work meetings. I get an hour or two for some Zoom meetings. Then it's my turn to play kindergarten teacher for two hours. My university does not care about family. They don't even mention issues with childcare and messaging, which is probably why we have so few women as professors. We have a danger of a group of women not graduating, a group of uh, postdocs pretty much leaving academia and saying, you know, I'm just not going to do it. Change involves wholesale cultural transformation. I think that the heartbreaking stories uh, vividly demonstrate how this pandemic has called into sharp relief the challenges that were detailed by the National Academies even before the pandemic broke out. And what we must and can do together to promote equity, diversity, and inclusion so that science, engineering, and medicine serve society optimally. Thank you. I've got just a couple of additional slides. So if we go to the next slide, as I mentioned, taking those heartbreaking stories 
into account, as well as the preliminary research and data that we had on hand. We laid out 12 findings and 31 research questions to build, that builds on all of this evidence that we gathered. We were not asked and we did not make any of the recommendations. But we wanted to make sure as we crafted the 31 research questions in our report that we were able to provide questions that would help more fully understand the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. And also questions to help us identify and to grow into opportunities that may help leaders and decision makers as they look for new ways to engage and to move forward in creating systems that are more equitable and more inclusive in higher education and in research. Taken together, our report's findings and research questions highlight the risk of losing some of the gains made in recent years and in creating a more, as we tried to create a more diverse and inclusive higher education research system. There are also opportunities to re-emphasize the promising practices, as well as what we could possibly learn from the pandemic as we look forward towards post-COVID operations. Next slide, please. So the committee noted two sort of fundamental truths that they hoped in the, or that they noticed in the report. First, there are going to be future disruptions that will test our system, and we're not necessarily going to see them coming. And second, that the future needs the STEM disciplines, and those disciplines need women, and we need women to survive, and we need women to thrive as we move forward. We hope that the information and the experiences assembled in the report will help illuminate opportunities to help mitigate long-term effects and to create more equitable higher education and research systems as everyone gathers more information together and considers the policies that could create more responsive systems. Final slide, please. What I've shared with you is only a fraction of what's in the full report. And we recognize it's gonna take a lot of time to understand everything that's happened and is continuing to happen and all of the impacts that it's had on women in academic STEM and across disciplines. So thank you for listening. I look forward to our questions and to our further discussion, as well as the presentations of my fellow panelists. The full report, the commission papers that informed the work of the committee and the video are all available at nap.edu for free. I will ask that these URLs get dropped into our uh, chat and our discussion so you can access them directly. Um, and I'll turn it back over uh, for further conversation. Um, thank you, Maria. That was very, very insightful. Um, yeah, so our next speaker is Aisha, whose research focuses on developing and using a uh, good ecological knowledge and informed biodiversity con conservation decisions. She's a strong advocate for equity and diversity, is an active member of the University of Sydney Pride, Pride Network and chairs the Queensland chapter of Queers in Science, a national initiative to support LGBTQIA plus people in STEM. Her research investigating inclusion and equity gaps for LGBTQIA plus people in uh, act, ad, ad, people in academic events received international media interest, including a nature editorial. Since she is based in Australia, we have a video presentation from her on how to ensure women and LGBTQIA plus representation is more equitable at events and conferences and what return from COVID might mean. So I will start the video. Um, Hi, thanks for having me. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to speak at the summit and acknowledge the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation, who are the traditional owners of the land on which I work, and I'll pay my respect to their elders, past, present, and emerging. Today, I'd like to tell you a little bit about how we can work towards more equitable and inclusive conferences and events for scientists. 
So did you know that almost half of all trans scientists and non-binary scientists experience workplace harassment in 2019? This harassment includes discriminatory, aggressive, bullying or exclusion behaviour in the workplace. So this harassment and discrimination and unconscious bias mean that scientific research remains male dominated. This infographic from Elsevier uh, brings it home really nicely. So the blue bars are uh, represent the percentage of women that are amongst in all inventors and uh, the scale represents um, where we were back in 1996 to 2000 and where we are today. So there's been a little bit of growth um, but not enough and when we see uh, the red bars which are the percentage of uh, women in um, research we can still see that we're dropping below that parity line of 50%. Uh, so we're getting there but we're not good enough. And what happens when one or more genders or sexual orientations is discriminated against? Well, we have poor workplace diversity. Um, and we've, we've got studies that have shown that the representation of some minorities like LGBTQIA people in STEM uh, are more than 20% lower than what we'd expect from the national representation. We can also get perceptions of workplaces being unsafe. Um, and we've seen research that shows that 40% of LGBTQIA scientists are not out to colleagues because uh, of perceptions of that being an unsafe um, uh, action to undertake in the workplace. And we also have mental health issues. 30% of LGBTQIA physical scientists in the UK have considered leaving their job because of the climate in their workplace um, towards um, their sexual orientation. And finally, we can get wage inequalities and there's been lots of research that has shown that minorities are generally earn less um, than the majority. And who is the majority? Generally, uh, white males. So under the right conditions, teams can benefit from various types of diversity, including scientific discipline, work experience, gender, ethnicity and nationality. To respond to the strong evidence of bias against certain genders and minorities, the last decade has seen an increasing number of and support for structural, um, that's like reg regulatory fixes to improve equity and diversity in the workplace. Um, and these include things like national and workplace gender equity policies, certification programs such as the Athena Swan Charter for Women in Science, codes of conduct in workplaces and at many events, and support networks like Women in Science, Pride and Ally Groups. This is great to see uh, the increase in these kinds of uh, structural fixes. And uh, what we've found is that these policies and actions are having some positive outcomes. Uh, we've found that gender diversity leads to better science. We've found that workplaces are more diverse. So increased representation of women um, are being found in academic and leadership roles. And we're also getting increased proportional representation of female PhD graduates in all academic group disciplines. Uh, so this increase in equitability in the workplace, especially for women, um, is, is really um, improving. And um, as a result of that, female scientists in Athena Swan certified institutions generally have increased number of opportunities, increased career satisfaction and increased fairness in their work allocation. So what I wanted to know is, uh, you know, we've got all of these regulatory fixes, this is great and it looks like they are having some impact in the workplace. But I wanted to know whether the efforts that are being made to implement these structural fi fixes in the workplace for gender and sex equity transfer to scientific events and more importantly if they're working. I was inspired to do this by attending a number of high profile international conferences over the last few years where I noticed disparities in the speakers or opportunities uh, for certain minority groups and I really wanted to bring this issue to the attention of everyone organising events for scientists. I reviewed the 30 biggest ecology and conservation conferences over the past 10 years to evaluate whether their actions and policies support participation across diverse sexual orientations and gender identities. My first question was just simply how many ecology and conservation conferences have implemented a code of ethical conduct? What I found was about half have a code of conduct and about half still have no code of conduct. This is despite many of the structural fixes in workplaces like Athena Swan um, and Women in Science having been around for you know, up to a decade. 
So now I'm going to step you through some of our uh, some of the results um, from the review that I undertook. Uh, and the conferences uh, with a code of conduct in uh, these results will be shown by the um, piece of pie on the top of the pie um, that's outlined in purple. And the conferences without a code of conduct will be represented um, on the bottom of the circle um, and outlined in orange. So what I wanted to know is, you know, does this code of conduct make the conference more inclusive? I had a look at all of the different initiatives that are being implemented in these 30 conferences to improve equity and inclusion. And what we can see from these first graphs is that conferences with codes were significantly more likely to implement structural initiatives that aim to minimise discrimination, implicit bias and harassment. So in addition to having that regulatory fix of having a code of conduct, they also implemented other procedures, um, points of contact for reporting misconduct, uh, and submission guidelines to promote speaker diversity. So all of the conference that included these initiatives uh, to support equity are shown in with pink filling, and the conferences that did not um, implement any of these initiatives are shown in the yellow filling. So what we can see is that generally, it's the conferences that have a code of conduct um, that are implementing these additional um, initiatives um, to promote diversity, equity and inclusion. Uh, so that's good to see. It's, it looks like at least from this perspective, even if not all of the conferences with codes of conduct are doing it, um, these are, the code of conduct is aligned with having these initiatives. I then looked at uh, a different kind of initiative that tries to minimise barriers to attendance. So um, those kinds of initiatives are things like offering financial assistance through grants. Um, and these were actually very common. Um, uh, as we can see by this top, um, top circle here, 47% um, of all conferences um, with code of conduct, 23%. Um, so that adds up to 70% uh, of all conferences having um, grants or discounts for uh, minority groups, uh, in particular LGBTQIA people. Um, so that's great, but what we see is it's not really any big difference between whether or not there was a code or no code in um, whether or not they offered grants. And in fact, um, the types of grants and levels of financial assistance were hugely variable. Um, interestingly, this bottom circle shows whether or not the conference was in an inclusive location. And what I found was that 47% of conferences were held in con locations that actually discriminate against certain identities. And there was no effect of having a code of conduct on whether the location was inclusive. So for example, a number of conferences with codes of conduct against discrimination and harassment um, that specifically mentioned uh, ensuring inclusion for the LGBTQIA community were held in countries where homosexuality is actually a criminal offence. And this, of course, is going to increase the barriers to that um, part of the community to attending such a conference. Um, other initiatives minimising barriers to attendance were generally pretty rare. Uh, for example, less than 10% of initiatives uh, of conferences promoted event safety and accessibility to different kinds of minorities. So the IMCC, that's the International Marine Conservation Conference, was actually the only conference that I evaluated that provided detailed information on their website to potential attendees about the cultural norms and policies in the event location. They also clearly promoted the accessibility of the event with dedicated pages on um, its IMCC for all policy. So this is a really great way of ensuring that the participants have a really clear understanding of uh, the location and its inclusivity uh, for their um, sexual or gender orientation. Uh, the third um, set of initiatives that I looked at was initiatives that try to maximise inclusion in education during the conference. So these are things like uh, including a set of diversity talks um, or including a diversity uh, social event. And it was really good to see that 50% of conferences held specific sessions, workshops um, or symposia devoted to diversity and equity. Unfortunately, this was not affected by whether or not the conference had 
um, an Equity, Diversity, Inclusion Code. So what does all this mean? What it means is that although there are a few initiatives that seem to be more aligned with having a code than not, in general, there's no um, impact of having a code of conduct on whether or not a conference um, has good policies and procedures for ensuring equity and inclusion for um, sexual orientation um, and gender equity. So this is an issue because you know, we then start to think, well, you know, what is this code of conduct for? And um, you know, why are people going to believe that these conferences are doing the right thing? Uh, it's even it's brought home even more strongly if we look at a very simple metric like the proportion of keynote speakers that were female at these conferences. And what we find is that codes are clearly not doing enough to support inclusion of genders and sexual orientations. This graph shows um, the years of each conference relative to the proportion of keynote speakers that were female, and there was no um, relationship between these two variables, despite informal and formal procedures for minimising implicit bias and increasing gender equity in speakers. So what we're seeing is that the proportion of female plenary speakers has not increased during the past 10 years, nor has having a code of conduct significantly influenced female representation in uh, plenary speakers. So this is a, a huge issue, given that gender equity specifically uh, women's rights is, is arguably um, the equity issue that has been given the most attention um, in many uh, areas of science um, in the last 10 years. So it's not all doom and gloom. We can fix this with better planning, community engagement to learn needs and structured implementation of initiative to support inclusion. If I came up with a timeline for implementing initiatives to improve equity, diversity, inclusion for diverse genders and sexual orientations at academic ecology and conservation conferences. This timeline uh, highlights initiatives from one to two years before the conference, like ensuring a diverse uh, organising committee and preparing equitable finance options, to the months prior to the conference when abstract and speaker selection, workshop and symposium offerings and presentation guidelines would benefit from clear uh, equity policies. Uh, and also conference registration can be set up to collect important details on attendee diversity, uh, including a gender neutral pronoun. And finally, we can follow this timeline through to post-conference initiatives like participant surveys, reporting of EDI outcomes, and revision of policies and initiatives for future conferences. Most of the steps in this timeline are not limited to ecology and conservation conferences, any discipline can use them to plan better events that support inclusion. If you're interested in any of um, what I've been uh, telling you and you'd like to know a little bit more, um, please go ahead and have a look at um, the research that I did in Nature, Ecology and Evolution. And I'd like to thank you all for listening and I'm really happy to be part of this summit and thanks for having me. Um, so, unfortunately, Aisha is not present with us uh, during this uh, session uh, due to the time difference between uh, between the U.S. Uh, and the Australia. Um, so, but but I'm sure that everyone found the the video informative. And uh, if you want, you can you know go and look up the the research in the research which was just mentioned. Um, for our next speaker uh, is ARPA. ARPA's research focuses on developing sustainable processes for making biorenewable fuels and chemicals. Currently, she is the vice president of uh, Iowa State University Postdoc Association. In the past, she has served as a member of the Diversity and International Task Forces of the NPA. She is passionate about gender equity and particularly interested in increasing part of it participation of women and other minority groups in STEM fields. Recently, she published an article on barriers of barriers to success of women postdoc during COVID-19 pandemic and beyond in the NPS postdocate. And for today's session, she will provide postdoc perspective on gender issues and COVID intersection. Welcome, Arpa. 
Thank you, Vipul, so much. And thanks to all the audience here uh, for taking the time out and coming uh, to my talk uh, about gender equity during the COVID time and beyond. I'm going to talk about a um, few questions that come in our mind when we think about the effects of COVID uh, last year and still going on and especially focusing on women postdoc um, and early career scientists, um, mostly in academic fields and also um, those who are in the STEM fields. And I'm very happy to see that much of my uh, talk is going to be um, related to some of the uh, factors that Maria uh, talked about. So I hope that you uh, can find um, a rel relatability. So the first question comes into our mind is, was COVID a wake up call for gender equity issues in postdoc life? And how did this pandemic uh, impact the lives and careers of both the male and female scientists? And was there any uh, big difference um, in how um, those um, got in fact impacted, impacted? And regarding this, we want to also understand um, did these problems of uh, gender equity got revo revealed because of the pandemic or they were already underlying and we were not aware of them or not paying attention? So regarding this, we also want to see how the pandemic has pushed the academic and scientific community to try to bring down these barriers uh, to success of uh, women postdocs and scientists. And uh, as uh, Vipul mentioned, I got a really good opportunity to um, think about these problems from a general postdoc uh, perspective. Definitely, this is not my um, research expertise. So I got a chance to think about from a general uh, person perspective. And I tried to read uh, more and enhance my knowledge in this area. And I got fascinated. So I put all the things I could learn in one place. And that got published in the NPA uh, uh, article uh, by postdoc. Postdoc it. And the first thing that uh, got revealed to me was that this pandemic was definitely less productive um, for female scientists due to increased household work. The first thing that we observed was that the lockdowns implemented during the coronavirus breakout turned many households into home offices and the school uh, and cl school ca classrooms just overnight. And it was very difficult, especially for female scientists, uh, postdocs with young dependents at home to balance work and life. And they got their productivity got impacted disproportionately and especially through publication, grant writing opportunities, and so on. And there is a study done in and published in Nature last year that showed clearly that um, between male and female participants, um, publishing rate definitely uh, deteriorated for more for the female participants. And when especially the female was a leading author in those papers, in many cases, many for many journal um, journals, the rate was much lower compared to pre-pandemic to post -pan uh, during the pandemic time. And when these uh, scientists were uh, surveyed, the common thing they said was um, due to the increased household work uh, and childcare work, they couldn't devote the same amount of time that they could before the pandemic. And when you think about these challenges of work-life balance for female identifying scientists, um, we can't, if you go deeper, you see that these are not very new. Um, studies suggest that women, especially in a dual academic ho uh, career households, mo are more likely to take care of the larger chunks of household and child care uh, than uh, often what men do. And this can exacerbate, uh, this can get exacerbated um, when there is a young child, especially between zero to five years old. And this sort of a baby penalty, as the uh, um, experts say, um, can also be related to the policies in place. And some studies have uh, shown that um, the US is the only industrialized country that does not offer a mandatory paid leave for new parents. 
And there was a bigger study with 205 research universities in the US and Canada recently that says that about 60% of the institutions have some form of paid parental leave, which means that 40% do not. So these problems uh, of work-life balance um, is very, very, um, it's definitely not new. So this kind of um, inspired me to think about what are the uh, underlying challenges or barriers for women uh, scientists to um, prosper. And the first thing I noticed was the leaky pipe, pipe, pipeline, which is a well-known phenomenon, those who uh, research in this field. And this metaphor means that literally losing women uh, and underrepresented minorities in STEM fields post PhD. Um, so if you um, consider this um, graph here, it shows that compared to married fathers, uh, single women and especially married mothers, um, as they progress through a post PhD career in STEM fields, entering tenure track position, um, the chances are very, uh, th that gets down to 35%. And as after having a child, it cuts down even further. And this is why you can, this can get re re reflected in the retention rate of female graduates in STEM, which is a much lower 25% compared to 40% for males right now. And so graduate school to postdoctoral scholars to tenure track faculty loses both men and women, it seems, but the loss is more significant for women. And if you look uh, further into this problem, uh, you can find some very interesting facts. Uh, studies are showing that women graduate students actually start off with a lot of uh, initial interest in uh, continuing in their fields, especially in science careers, but they drop out after uh, PhD and postdoc and so on. And the reasons reported by them um, can be something like discomfort around male dominated work environment or culture, doubts about getting opportunity to be promoted to senior positions, and definitely concerns about balancing uh, the early career uh, life with a young family. And as Maria was also pointing out that when the question of race and class comes, it just gets much worse. The inter intersection of gender with race and class could be additional barriers for many underrepresented minority groups in STEM fields. In fact, if you uh, look at uh, National Science Foundation data, you will see that Hispanic, uh, Black, American, Indians, uh, so um, these groups are sitting at a depressing low of 11% in their participation of uh, participation in the science and engineering workforce compared to their general participation rates in the population. And COVID-19 um, pandemic comes here with a negative effect because um, these rates can be much uh, worse due to the hiring freeze going on, economic down cycle and increased household work, childcare um, issues and so on. So I wanted to um, ask, um, I wanted to ask uh, myself and the community, what are the deeper problems really and where we can do some more work to um, um, solve these problems? And the first thing came to our mind is that um, role models, the participation rate, um, that has to be very important because the small percentage of representation of women and other minority groups in the STEM fields is a historic problem. So the entry point is really the problem as much as the uh, later leaky pipeline. And it could have a very bad impact on the next generation of global workforce that is um, coming up. Several studies very interestingly reported that children, especially young girls, when asked to draw a mathematician or scientist, um, they were more likely to draw men, often in a lab coat rather than women. 
And if, if you look around, you will see that there is definitely a persistent subconscious image of male representative um, of STEM professionals. And this could be a very important reason for lower entry rates of girls and their further continuation as a leader in the field um, for sure. Female scientists and engineers still make up uh, much low shares in engineering fields like 15% or 26%. And effect of COVID-19, especially in developing, uh, developing countries, uh, which was like um, keeping girls out of school could have a very detrimental effect down the line. Another very important and deeper aspect of these barriers is the imposter syndrome, which is really um, something to do with how we think, how um, underrepresented minority groups in STEM um, psychologically go through this um, issue. And um, this is nothing but doubting your capabilities of performing your job roles and thinking that we are basically frauds and we did not deserve to get this job. We somehow by chance got it. And soon we will be revealed to the um, uh, surrounding and our colleagues will know and we will lose the job. So that kind of um, is much more prominent as the experts say uh, in women and other underrepresented minority groups in the field of STEM. In fact, uh, when Jennifer Dudna, a 2020 Nobel Prize winner in chemistry, was um, asked about this, she said that uh, even she had um, issues of imposter syndrome uh, earlier in her career. And she thinks that's why uh, society and our uh, community should be very much open about the challenges that women face. And Effect of COVID-19 comes in here even as a negative one because the uncertainty about around job search, economic instability, um, all of that can easily throw away one's self-belief and that could lead to imposter syndrome even further. Lastly, one big barrier when you think about international scholars and scientists uh, who come to um, uh, U.S. for their studies and then uh, research is the immigration and travel policies. This often uh, brings the choice between family and choosing career, especially for women, because again, um, the tendency that women will assume uh, more of the household work, more of taking care of the family, um, kind of puts them in the back seat and makes them trailing spouse and um, not go for high intensity STEM career or a faculty career. So, and in the COVID-19 time, there has been lots of changes and back and forth between immigration policies and um, travel bans. And that could easily uh, complicate lives of uh, women postdoc and scientists um, here in the US. And this has a long term effect because female scholars are uh, might get uh, longer gaps and slowdowns in their career growth. And US immigration rules have been continuously altering during the pandemic in order to secure more jobs for the American workers. And this could, could definitely uh, worsen the conditions for women postdoc. And so at this point, um, I would like to go ahead and take uh, Vipul's help. Uh, and if you could um, look at the chat box and use the Mentimeter link and use the code if you have to, um, and then provide your response for what you think can uh, we can do to overcome some of these barriers to success for women postdocs and scientists. And I'll give you a few seconds to do so. And I will also try to share my screen so you can see the results.
And so some of the things I can see, and hopefully you can see too, is flexible schedule, engage in dialogue, uh, talk, mentoring. That is all fantastic. Educate employers, communication, mentoring, start early, communication, updated policies. That is all great. So with that, in the interest of time, thank you very much for your um, responses. I will go back and stop sharing. And if I could get my last slide, uh, Vipul, just the last, absolute last one. Yeah, thank you so much. And so you are absolutely on track with that. Thanks for your responses. The first thing that comes in mind is that better childcare policies and benefits. And uh, I want to mention that I got a chance as the vice president of Iowa State um, to work on this or kind of uh, uh, tap into this area a little bit. And I can say that our postdoc association and the graduate college are doing a fantastic job to uh, include more of postdoc uh, opinions and what they really want. Um, so the childcare um, policies um, are are getting improved uh, and we are trying to do uh, something like uh, opening up library spaces for postdoc uh, new parents um, so that they can work at the same time as uh, looking at their child. So a lot can be done uh, just from your institute. So that's one thing. The other thing is definitely increased efforts from academic uh, departments and mentors, especially as some of you said, um, to help women postdocs who are at early stage of their careers um, so that they can feel welcome. Like some of you have said, talk more, communicate more. That is absolutely right on. Um, so they can share their issues freely um, about the work-life balance issues. Also, we have to bring um, strategies to help uh, and guide postdocs early on um, with new uh, who are new parents to find appropriate employee assistance program that are maybe already available at the institutes, but they are not aware of it or don't know how to use it. Then also for immigration, frequent workshops and um, events can be organized um, um, locally or such as by the NPA uh, to get to know about those things. Strategic planning for the long term and actions have to be taken to overcome the gender, racial and ethnic disparities in hiring postdocs or early career scientists in the first place. And also professional development opportunities for the diverse postdoc community with equal equity minded mentorship is very much needed. And with that, I would like to conclude uh, with a suggestion for all of you uh, who are interested in this uh, topic. Go ahead and look for this movie, which is named as Picture a Scientist. It's a fantastic film. I have got the opportunity to see this. Um, it talks about all of these issues and re with real people who have gone through them and how they try to overcome uh, and what policies are in place, the laws and everything. It's a fantastic movie and I'm sure it will inspire you more to think about these barriers careers and how to solve the, resolve them for the success of women postdocs and uh, scientists. Thank you very much for your attention and hope this opens up questions. Um, thank you, Arpa. So if uh, anyone has any questions for, for Maria and Arpa, please put them in the chat or in the Q&A and uh, we can go over those questions. Even if they're not the questions, if any comments as well. I guess while we are waiting for people to, people to think of some points. Uh, Maria, do you have a breakdown of the participants in your report? Uh, like how many of those participants were postdocs? Or do you not have that? You mean how many were in the October survey? Yes, yes. Um, yeah, we do have a little bit of that data. Um, I don't have it in front of me. I'm going to look it up and see if I can get this going. Um, so 
I will note the the survey was fielded and requested for people um, who were in the faculty. Oh, I don't have access to my files right now, but I um, in our in the appendices of the report um, that information is included. And there were a couple of postdocs who did respond um, to the survey, but it was definitely not a majority of the individuals who were included. Um, so there were about um, 700 and some people who were on the tenure track and a total of around 800 or 900 and some folk um, who responded overall. Um, so the postdocs would have been included in that 100 plus, 180 something, I believe. But um, those also included uh, individuals who were our staff scientists or uh, contingent faculty, other non-tenure track positions. Um, and we didn't disaggregate on, on those basis. And again, um, that, that survey was just a, a smaller, um, it was independent of the committee's work. It was done by a set of commissioned paper authors. Um, and so it really, it informed a lot of what the committee thought about, but it was just one of our, our sources um, that we pulled on for the report overall. Um, there was another uh, survey though, of, that focused just on postdocs um, that was published by, I believe it was published in Nature that really looked at um, some of the, the concerns that were held by uh, postdoctoral scholars um, across disciplines um, and about, you know, career trajectories, about securing funding, about um, being able to conduct their research. Um, it's a, often a difficult time in general, and it was particularly uh, strenuous and um, during the, during the lockdowns and during the, the restrictions that were in place. Right. So, so you mentioned in your um, results that Zoom and you know other uh, virtual platforms made it easier for attending the events. Um, but do you have any thoughts on like best practices as we transition back to in-person events after COVID? And Arpa, you can you know also join in from a postdoc perspective that of if you have attended uh, ev events in the in the last year and then now that we are moving to in-person what what lessons we can, if you have any comments on what, what lessons we can take on with us. Yeah, so one of the, the major findings from the report is exactly as you said, that, um, you know, moving towards to virtual platforms, like what we're on right now, allowed a lot of people to attend that maybe wouldn't have been able to attend otherwise. Um, it actually lowered barriers for a lot of folk um, who have caregiving responsibilities, um, who otherwise would not have been able to participate in collaborative uh, endeavors. Um, it allowed people to have different structures for workshops. Um, it allowed presenters to, you know, have a, a panel, you know, present in Australia and also in England in a single day or in, you know, and those things weren't considered feasible previously. So I hope we don't lose that. Um, but at the same time, a lot of the concerns that were in place with a dominated in-person way of approaching collaborations or approaching professional meetings are still, um, still a concern, right? Um, it's too bad that our, our third panelist was not present and she probably would be able to speak to this more, um, but issues around harassment in virtual settings is still uh, highly present. Um, there were uh, reports from across institutions in the United States um, having to do with uh, sexual harassment in institutions and while there were changes to the Title IX regulations, which may have also affected reporting, um, we it's it's unclear 
and it seems to be, you know, that the same sorts of gender and other forms of sexual harassment have just moved to, to virtual spaces. And we need to now figure out ways to prevent those and make sure our inclusive spaces are, or our virtual spaces are also inclusive. Um, so we, I, I note that in our report, we don't lay out recommendations, but we do have some, some research questions that dig into, you know, how can you make, um, how can you use this technology to make sure that you're supporting women and how can you make sure that you are holding conferences that are open and fair and accessible to all people that um, that are remaining and in developing inclusive environments. Um, I would love to hear to Ar Arpa's thoughts on this as well though and whether uh, you doing your your own research found any any good examples right so my opinion is again more of from the general standpoint and um i do want to mention that the virtual um conferences um the first thing comes to my, our mind is the cons because a lot of these uh like especially postdocs or early career scientists they do want to reach out to people or network a lot uh, at this stage of their career and that's very important um and that almost everyone that i know of has you know reported that we want to go back to the in-person conferences uh, for these uh, live interactions but uh, I don't know. I wonder. So, yeah, Aisha's work would have been great. Uh, she, uh, it would have been great to have her here. Um, what the impact has um, between like in-person interaction and virtual interactions. I myself have tried um, both of them and I kind of found that it's, it's OK to do the virtual interactions, but the follow up really happens better when you have met the person um, um, face to face and uh, had a chance to talk and explain things better uh, in the virtual sessions. It's a limited time in which you have to do the uh, interaction. So that's a barrier that I found. But again, looking from the standpoint of equity, especially for uh, students and postdocs, I would say the virtual conferences are great because they are cheaper. Um, sometimes they are much cheaper because you don't have to travel or find a hotel or something. And that is really uh, helpful. Um, and definitely everything that uh, Maria said about the um, about having a young family and taking care of them at the same time. Um, and, you know, you can be in different places around the world at the same time uh, is a fantastic advantage. So we have I think we have to balance uh, depending on the situation we are in and what we are looking for from this conference to gain and maybe find out a hybrid situation. And a lot of conferences in my field, at least I know, uh, are going to think about in keeping some sort of a virtual format, as Maria also was pointing uh, to. Yeah, thank you. Um, do any of you, so there's a comment in the, in the chat section that if there's any data on dropout rates for women postdoc that compare the situation for industry postdocs versus academic postdocs, do either of you have any uh, knowledge or thoughts on this point? So I don't have data on hand, and I would be interested to know actually whether uh, any of the representatives or, or folk from uh, NPA might have that information. Um, one of the, the first reports I ever worked on from the at, with the National Academies was actually the postdoctoral experience revisited, and I remember as we were were looking at um, data and information on the postdocs on postdocs, we really looked for um, you know, where, how, and, and where various postdocs, uh, were, were having these, these endeavors and, uh, information on postdocs in industry was actually one of the things that we had a difficult time locating. So, but again, that was, you know, almost, almost a decade ago now when we were conducting the information on that report. Um, so I would hope that we have a better understanding of the of a fuller picture on on postdocs. 
Um, I will note though that one of the, the findings and the understanding that came out of that report really did highlight that the postdoctoral time period for most individuals is a, a time when people are establishing families, they're setting up uh, and determining the career paths and various other aspects. So um, I don't know that it is different, all that different in terms of those uh, external influencing factors, whether you are in academia or in government or in industry. Um, but again, I don't have anything that I can point to to support or supplement that. Yeah, I would say the same thing that I'm not personally aware of such a particular study that compares the situation between industry and academic postdocs. Um, often what I could gather from the literature I surveyed for this article was that they consider industry transition or academic transition to be a successful, you know, like long term career, STEM career, especially. And so um, it was more like the dropout, like, you know, you know, like they're only going to take care of the family. Um, so something like that versus having a long term, like, you know, a STEM career uh, as a professional. So that's that's from my experience. I do want to mention that um, the National Science Foundation, uh, I think they have uh, produced some uh, data or uh, statistics from which I got some of my data. And that comes across gender and um, at the intersection of gender and race uh, and so on in STEM fields. So that is something maybe you can look into and see if they have any uh, thing like formulated like industry and academic uh, postdocs uh, for them. Great, thank you Arpan, thank you Maria. Um, uh, yeah, I think, uh, so since we have like last four minutes, uh, just like a quick, do you do you have any thoughts on uh, on like now that we are going back in person? COVID is kind of over or getting over. Um, so, do you do you have any thoughts on what what are our lessons learned uh, for equity uh, in academia or in this, or in like the whole research environment? Do you have any like final words for that? Go ahead, Arpa. Sure. So I think some of the things that we discussed uh, as per solutions um, to some of these barriers for women postdocs and other underrepresented minority groups, um, I believe that policies definitely have to be looked into, uh, you know, parental leaves um, and all of that, childcare benefits. Um, and from my own uh, experience working as uh, working in our Iowa State University uh, Postdoc Association, I felt like, you know, you have to have a very good team who really care about these issues. Um, and that's the first starting point. A lot of the people around us don't even know about these issues. I did not know when I started to, uh, when I started my postdoc. So, uh, and coming from uh, a different country, uh, of course, we are not aware of all the policies, but as an international scholar, again, it becomes even more important to know, uh, in, enhance our knowledge first in this about these issues. Uh, so, you know, hold uh, such webinars often and then let people come here and share their um, experiences and study reports and everything. It's very, very uh, good as a starting point. And you know, people want to help. That's the general thing I have learned uh, in the last two years. People do want to help. Uh, people want to care about the policies. Um, but the first thing is awareness. And so better policies for sure. And the other thing I, I would say that if we can come up with creative strategies um, to kind of um, like, you know, the library child care space that um, uh, we are working on at Iowa State is very interesting because you don't have to do a whole lot. You have uh, a nice space inside the library and you make that kind of enclosed um, so that it's safe and everything for the children. But also it will have a workstation, which is 
um, you know, like safe for um, to have children around and the um, and the parent can't work along with taking care of the child uh, on the side. So such things like, you know, um, like the spatial uh, accommodation uh, can be very uh, can be very um, good. So something like these kind of creative um, infrastructural changes that are small and inexpensive to do, I think can go a long way. And those things we can learn from our experience during the COVID time when we got locked down uh, within our house and, uh, you know, like uh, thinking about how, how we can work at the same time, uh, take care of the family. Yeah, I, I fully agree, Irva. I think that um, we've been given this, this has been a, a, a horrible and traumatic, a globally traumatic experience that we've been going through. Um, but I don't think that it's without its possibility of actually building back. Um, we, the, the promising practices report that ARPA included in her presentation that I included in my presentation um, lays out a whole number of different ways that we can support women um, better within the STEM enterprise. A lot of it has to do with intentional thinking, with planning, with iterating, with piloting, with growing, with holding ourselves accountable, um, with measuring and with doing this sort of cyclical engagement over and over again and really developing policies and practices that are working for the system and for the individuals um, rather than expanding and, and pushing uh, inequities larger. Um, this past year, we shown a flashlight on a lot of seriously inequitable aspects of our systems that we work in. And I think that we now have an opportunity to rather than try and go back and sort of plaster over gaping wounds to actually try and fix them using promising practices that we have the evidence to support. So it's it's gonna take work, but we, we know some things that should actually help. So let's try and do them. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it says really hopefully, but slightly cynically. I think those final words, let's try and do them. I think that's a perfect end for today's session. Uh, so I really wanna thank you both um, and also Aisha who couldn't join us, but thank you to all the speakers for uh, sharing sharing your work and uh, uh, just giving a very insightful thoughts and you know your knowledge. Um, on that note, I will uh, also thank everyone for joining us today, but I will, uh, give the mic to Tom now, who will talk about the next session. Thanks very much, people. And I realize we're at the end of the time. So thanks to our panelists uh, to, and to you, Vipul, uh, very much for an insightful and very timely presentation uh, in our fourth in our session here uh, in our summit on gender equity. So thank you. I wanted to remind folks as, as we close out today that the NPA is uh, wants to keep this conversation going. Um, so please take the lessons you've learned from today um, to improve your postdoc, or if you're not a postdoc, your other professional experience. Um, speak up and contribute this information that you've learned today uh, to help improve your institution and the policies within your institution. And uh, perhaps they can see how they can help you in your personal life. Uh, in addition, uh, the NPA is absolutely committed to improving the postdoc experience and fully dedicated to uh, working on DEI issues, diversity issues in that environment. Uh, if you're interested in helping uh, get involved in that push and that fight, check out the MPA website, uh, nationalpostdoc.org. There are opportunities to volunteer as well as to lead um, efforts within the NPA and would love to have your contributions. ARPA is a great example. Uh, yeah, I found ARPA from her wonderful piece that she wrote at the post docket um, and that's how we connected so the post docket is, is one way to get involved they uh, have articles that are available uh, for you or opportunities for you to publish articles through the post docket on issues important to the postdoc community 
Uh, we have one more panel remaining in our Gender Equity Summit for 2021 that's happening in about 40 minutes at 3 p.m. Eastern and about challenges that are facing the LGBTQ plus community in the postdoc environment today. And I hope you can tune in for that. Thanks very much. Thanks to everybody, both attendees and panelists for the, for the conversation today. Take care.